Chapter Two of Grey Lensman by E. E. Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two. During practically all of the long trip back to Earth, Kennison kept pretty much to his cabin, thinking deeply, blockly, and he admitted ruefully to himself to very little purpose. And at Prime Base, through week after week of its feverish activity, he continued to th he continued to think. Finally, however, he was snatched out of his dark abstraction by no less a personage than Surgeon General Lacey. Snap out of it, kid that worthy advised smilingly. When you concentrate on one thing too long, you know, the vortices of thought occupy narrower and narrower loci until finally the effective volume becomes infinitesimal. Or mathematically, the then range of cogitation, integrated between the limits of plus and minus infinity, approaches zero as a limit. Huh? What are you talking about? the lensman demanded. Poor mathematics, perhaps, but sound psychology, Lacey grinned. It got your undivided attention, didn't it? That was what I was after. In plain English, if you keep on thinking around in circles, you'll soon be biting yourself in the small of the back. Come on, you and I are going places. Where? To the Grand Ball in honor of the Grand Fleet, my boy. Old Dr. Lacey prescribes it for you as a complete and radical change of atmosphere. Let's go. The city's largest ballroom was a blaze of light and color. A thousand polychromic lamps flooded their radiance downward through draped bunting upon an even more colorful throng. Two thousand items of feminine loveliness were there, in raiment whose fabrics were the best of hundreds of planets, whose hues and shades put the spectrum itself to shame. There were over two thousand men, clad in plain or beribboned or bemetalled full civilian dress or in the variously panoplied dress uniforms of the many services. "'You're dancing with Miss Forrester first, Kennison,' the surgeon introduced them informally, and the lensman found himself gliding away with a stunning blonde, ravishingly and revealingly dressed in a dazzlingly blue wisp of Menarchan glamourette, fashion's diner cri. To the uninformed, Kennison's garb of plain gray leather might have seemed incongruous indeed in that brilliantly and fastidiously dressed assemblage. But to those people, as to us of today, the drab, starkly utilitarian uniform of the unattached lensman transcended far any other, however resplendent, worn by men. And literally hundreds of eyes followed the strikingly handsome couple as they slid rhythmically out upon the polished floor. But a measure of the tall beauty's customary poise had deserted her. She was slimly taut in the circle of the lensman's arm. Her eyes were downcast, and suddenly she missed a step. "'Excuse me for stepping on your feet,' he apologized. "'A fellow gets out of practice, flitting around in a speedster so much. "'Thanks for taking the blame, but it's my fault entirely. I know it as well as you do,' she replied, flushing uncomfortably. "'I do know how to dance, too, but... "'Well, you're a gray lensman, you know.' "'Huh?' he ejaculated in honest surprise, and she looked up at him for the first time. "'What has that fact got to do with the price of Venerian orchids in Chicago, or with my clumsy walking all over your slippers?' "'Everything in the world,' she assured him. Nevertheless her stiff young body relaxed, and she fell into the graceful, accurate dancing which she really knew so well how to do. You see, I don't suppose that any of us have ever seen a great lensman before, except in pictures, and actually to be dancing with one is so thrilling that it is really a shock. I have to get used to it gradually, so to speak. Why, I don't even know how to talk to you. One couldn't possibly call you plain mister, as one would any or— It'll be QX if you just call me Say, he informed her. Maybe you'd rather not dance with a dub. What say we go get us a sandwich and a bottle of Phalin or something? No, never, she exclaimed. I didn't mean it that way at all. I'm going to have this full dance with you and enjoy every second of it. And later I'm going to pack this dance card, which I hope you will sign for me, away in lavender, so it will go down in history that in my youth I really did dance with Grey Lindsman Kennison. I see that I have recovered enough so that I can talk and dance at the same time. Do you mind if I ask you some silly questions about space?" "'Go ahead. 
They won't be silly, if I'm any judge. Elementary, perhaps, but not silly. I hope so, but I think you're being charitable again. Like most of the girls here, I suppose, I have never been out in deep space at all. Besides a few hops to the moon, I have taken only two flits, and they were both only interplanetary, one to Mars and one to Venus. I never could see how you deep space men can really understand what you're doing, either the frightful speeds at which you travel, the distance you cover, or the way your communications work. In fact, a professor told us that no human mind can understand figures of those magnitudes at all. But you must understand them, I should think. Oh, perhaps. Or maybe the guy isn't human? Kinnison laughed deeply, infectiously. No, your professor was right. We can't understand the figures, but we don't have to. All we have to do is to work with them. And now that it has just percolated through my skull who you really are, that you are Gladys Forrester, it is quite clear that you are in that same boat. Me? How? How? she exclaimed. The human mind cannot really understand a million of anything. Yet your father, an immensely wealthy man, gave you clear title to a million credits in cash, to train you in finance in the only way that really produces results, the hard way of actual experience. You lost a lot of it at first, but at last account you had got it all back, and some besides, in spite of all the smart guys trying to take it away from you. The fact that your brain cannot envisage a million credits has not interfered with your manipulation of that account, has it? No, but that's entirely different, she protested. Not in any essential feature, he countered. I can explain it best, perhaps, by analogy. You can't visualize, mentally, the size of North America, either, yet that fact does not bother you in the least while you are driving around on it in an automobile. What do you drive? On the ground, I mean, not in the air. A Dukahotsny Sportster? Hmm. Top speed, 140 miles per hour, and I suppose you cruise between 90 and 100. We'll have to pretend that you drive a crowned-over sedan or some other big slow jalopy, so that you will tour at about 60 and have an absolute top of 90. Also, you have a radio. On the broadcast bands you can hear a program from three or four thousand miles away, or in shortwave from anywhere on Tellus. I can get tight-beam shortwave programs from the moon, the girl broke in. I've heard them lots of times. Yes, Kennison assented dryly, at such times as that didn't happen to be any interference. Static is pretty bad lots of times, the heiress agreed. Well, change miles to parsecs, and you've got the picture of deep space speeds and operations, Kennison informed her. Our speed varies, of course, with the density of matter in space. But on the average, say, one atom of substance per ten cubic centimeters in space, we tour at about sixty parsecs an hour, and full blast is about ninety, and our ultra-wave communicators working below the level of the ether, in the sub-ether, whatever that is, she interrupted. That's as good a description or definition of it as any, he grinned at her. We don't know what even the ether is, or whether or not it exists as an objective reality, to say nothing of what we so nonchalantly call the sub-ether. We do not understand gravity, although we can make it to order. No scientist yet has been able to say how it is propagated, or even whether or not it is propagated. No one has been able to devise any kind of an apparatus or meter or method by which its nature, period, or velocity can be determined. Neither do we know anything about time or space. In fact, fundamentally, we don't really know much of anything at all," he concluded. "'Says you. But that makes me feel better anyway,' she confided, snuggling a little closer. "'Go on about the communicators.' "'Ultra waves are faster than ordinary radio waves, which of course travel through the ether with the velocity of light in just about the same ratio as that of the speed of our ships to the speed of slow automobiles that is, the ratio of a parsec to a mile, roughly nineteen billion to one. Range, of course, is proportional to the square of the speed. Nineteen billion! she exclaimed. And you just said that nobody could understand even a million. That's the point exactly, he went on, undisturbed. You don't have to understand or to visualize it. 
All you have to do is remember that deep space vessels and communicators can cover distance in parsecs at practically the same rate that Tellurian automobiles can cover miles. So when some space flea talks to you about parsecs, just think of miles in terms of an automobile and a radio and you won't be far off. I never heard it explained that way before. It does make it ever so much simpler. Will you sign this, please? Just one more point. The music had ceased, and he was signing her card, preparatory to escorting her back to her place. Like your supposedly tight-beam Luna Tellus hookups, our long-range, equally tight-beam communicators are very sensitive to interference, either natural or artificial. So while under perfect conditions we can communicate clear across the galaxy, there are times, particularly when the pirates are scrambling the channels, that we can't drive a beam from here to Alpha Centauri. Thanks a lot for the dance. The other girls did not quite come to blows as to which of them was to get him next, and shortly, he never did know exactly how it came about, he found himself dancing with a luscious, cuddly little brunette, clad, partially clad at least, in a high-slitted, flame-colored sheath of some new fabric which the Lindsman had never seen before. It looked like solidified, tightly woven electricity. "'Oh, Mr. Kennison!' his new partner cooed ecstatically. "'I think that all spacemen, and you Lensmen particularly, are just too perfectly darn heroic for anything. Why, I think that space is just terrible. I simply can't cope with it at all.' "'Ever been out, miss?' he grinned. He had never known many social butterflies, and temporarily he had forgotten that such girls as this one really existed. "'Why, of course!' The young woman kept on being exclamatory. "'Clear out to the moon, perhaps?' he hazarded. "'Don't be ridic. Ever so much further than that. Why, I went clear to Mars. And it gave me the screaming memes, no less. I thought I would collapse.' The dance ended, ultimately, and the other dances with other girls followed. But Kennison could not throw himself into the gaiety surrounding him. During his cadet days he had enjoyed such revels to the full, but now the whole thing left him cold. His mind insisted upon reverting to its problem. Finally, in the throng of young people on the floor, he saw a girl with a mass of red bronze hair and a supple, superbly molded figure. He did not need to await her turning to recognize his erstwhile nurse and later assistant, whom he had last seen just this side of far distant Bosia too. Mac! To her mind alone he sent out a thought through his lens. For the love of Clono, lend a hand, rescue me. How many dances have you got ahead? None at all. I'm not dating ahead. She jumped as though someone had jabbed her with a needle, then paused in panic, eyes wide, breath coming fast, breast pounding. She had felt lensed thoughts before, but this was something else, something entirely different. Every cell of her brain was open to that lensman's mind. And what was she seeing? She blanketed her thoughts desperately, tried with all her might not to think at all. QX, Mac, the thought went quietly on within her mind, quite as though nothing unusual were occurring. No intrusion meant. You didn't think it. I already knew that if you started dating ahead you'd be tied up until day after tomorrow. Can I have the next one? Sure, Kim. Thanks. The lens is off for the rest of the evening." She sighed in relief as he snapped the telepathic line as though he were hanging up the receiver of a telephone. "'I'd like to dance with all you kids,' he addressed a large group of buds surrounding him and eyeing him hungrily. "'But I've got this next one. See you later, perhaps.' And he was gone. "'Sorry, fellows,' he remarked casually as he made his way through the circle of men around the gorgeous redhead. Sorry, but this dance is mine, isn't it, Miss MacDougall?" She nodded, flashing the radiant smile which had so aroused his ire during his hospitalization. I heard you invoke your spaceman's god, but I was beginning to be afraid that you had forgotten this dance. And she said she wasn't dating ahead, the diplomat, murmured an ambassador aside. Don't be a dope, a captain of marines muttered in reply. She meant with us. That's a gray lensman. 
Although the nurse, as has been said, was anything but small, she appeared almost petite against the lensman's mighty frame as they took off. Silently the two circled the great hall once, lustrous golden-green gown of earthly nylon this one, and less revealing than most, swishing in perfect cadence against deftly and softly stepping high-laced boots. "'This is better, Mac,' Kinnison sighed finally. "'But I lack just seven thousand kilocycles of being in tune with this. Don't know what's the matter, but it's clogging my jets. I must be getting to be a space louse.' A space louse? You? Uh-uh, she shook her head. You know very well what the matter is. You're just too much of a man to mention it. Huh? he demanded. Uh-huh, she asserted, positively, if obliquely. Of course you're not in tune with this crowd. How could you be? I don't fit into it any more myself, and what I'm doing isn't even a muffled flare compared to your job. Not one in ten of these fluffs here tonight have ever been beyond the stratosphere. Not one in a hundred has ever been out as far as Jupiter, or has ever had a serious thought in her head, except about clothes or men. And not one of them has any more idea of what a lensman really is than I have of hyperspace or of non-Euclidean geometry." "'Kitty, Kitty,' he laughed. "'Sheath the little claws before you scratch somebody.' "'That isn't caddishness. It's the bare-faced truth. Or perhaps, she amended honestly, it's both true and caddish, but it's certainly true. And that isn't the half of it. No one in the universe except yourself really knows what you are doing, and I'm pretty sure that only two others even suspect, and Dr. Lacey is not one of them," she concluded surprisingly. Though shocked Kinnison did not miss a step. You don't fit into this matrix any more than I do, he agreed quietly. Suppose you and I could do a little flit somewhere? Surely, Kim. And breaking out of the crowd, they strolled out into the grounds. Not a word was said until they were seated upon a broad low bench beneath the spreading foliage of a tree. Then, what did you come here for tonight, Mac? The real reason, he demanded abruptly. I, me, uh, you, I mean, oh, skip it, the girl stammered, a wave of scarlet flooding her face and down even to her superb bare shoulders. Then she steadied herself and went on. You see, I agree with you. As you say, I check you to nineteen decibels. Even Dr. Lacey, with all his knowledge, can be slightly screwy at times, I think. Oh, so that's it. It was not. It was only a very minor part of her reason. But the nurse would have bitten her tongue off rather than admit that she had come to that dance solely and only because Kimball Kennison was to be there. You knew then that this was old Lacey's idea? Of course. You would never have come else. He thinks that you may begin wobbling on the beam pretty soon unless you put out a few breaking jets. And you? Not in a million, Kim. Lacey is as cockeyed as Trinko's ether, and I as good as told him so. He may wobble a bit, but you won't. You've got a job to do, and you're doing it. You'll finish it, too, in spite of all the vermin infesting all the galaxies of the macrocosmic universe," she finished passionately. Lono's brazen whiskers, Mac," he turned suddenly, and stared intently down into her wide, gold-flecked, tawny eyes. She stared back for a moment, then looked away. "'Don't look at me like that!' she almost screamed. "'I can't stand it. You make me feel stark naked. I know that your lens is off. I'd simply die if it wasn't. But I think that you're a mind-reader even without it.' She did know that that powerful telepath was off and would remain off, and she was glad indeed of that fact, for her mind was seething with thoughts which that lensman must not know then or ever. And for his part the lensman knew, what she did not even suspect, that had he chosen to exert the powers at his command, she would have been naked mentally and physically to his perception. But he did not exert those powers then. The amenities of human relationship demanded that some fastness of reserve remain inviolate, but he had to know what this woman knew. If necessary, he would take the knowledge away from her by force, so completely that she would never know that she had ever known it. 
therefore. "'Just what do you know, Mac, and how did you find it out?' he demanded quietly, but with a stern finality of inflection that made a quick chill run up and down the nurse's back. "'I know a lot, Kim,' the girl shivered slightly, even though the evening was warm and balmy. "'I learned it from your own mind. When you call me back there on the floor, you didn't send just a single sharp thought, just as though you were speaking to me as you always did before. Instead it seemed as though I was actually inside your own mind, the whole of it. I've heard Lensman speak of a wide-open two-way, but I never had even the faintest inkling of what it would be like. No one could who has never experienced it. Of course I didn't, I couldn't, understand a millionth of what I saw, or seemed to see. It was too vast, too incredibly immense. I never dreamed any mortal could have a mind like that, Kim, but it was ghastly, too. It gave me the creepy jitters. It sent me down completely out of control for a second. And you didn't even know it. I know you didn't. I didn't want to look, really, but I couldn't help seeing. And I'm glad I did. I wouldn't have missed it for the world. She finished almost incoherently. Hmm. That changes the picture entirely. Much to her surprise, the man's voice was calm and thoughtful, not at all incensed, not even disturbed. So I spilled the beans myself on a wide open two way and didn't even realize it. I knew that you were backfiring about something, but thought it was because I might think you guilty of petty vanity, and I call you a dumbbell once, he marveled. Twice, she corrected him, and the second time I was never so glad to be called names in my whole life. Now I know that I was getting to be a space louse. Uh-uh, Kim, she denied again gently. And you aren't a brat or a lug or a clunker either, even though I may have thought at times that you were all of those things. But now that I've actually got all this stuff, what can you, what can we do about it? Perhaps. Probably, I think, since I gave it to you myself, I'll let you keep it," Kinnison decided slowly. "'Keep it?' she exclaimed. "'Of course I'll keep it. Why, it's in my mind. I'll have to keep it. Nobody can take knowledge away from anyone.' "'Oh, sure, of course,' he murmured absently. There were a lot of things that Mac didn't know, and probably no good end would be served by enlightening her further. You see, there's a lot of stuff in my mind that I don't know much about myself yet. Since I gave you an open channel there must have been a good reason for it, even though consciously I don't know myself what it was." He thought intensely for moments, then went on. Undoubtedly the subconscious. Probably it recognized the necessity of discussing the whole situation with someone having a fresh viewpoint, someone whose ideas can help me develop a fresh angle of attack. Haines and I think too much alike for him to be of much help." "'You trust me that much?' the girl asked, dumbfounded. "'Certainly,' he replied without hesitation. "'I know enough about you to know that you can keep your mouth shut.'" Thus, unromantically, did Kimball Kennison, great lensman, acknowledge the first glimmerings of the dawning perception of a vast fact, that this nurse and he were two between whom there never would nor could exist an iota of doubt or of question. Then they sat and talked. Not idly, as is the fashion of lovers, or of the minutiae of their own romantic affairs did these two converse, but cosmically of the entire universe and of the already existent conflict between the culture of civilization and Bosconia. They sat there, romantically enough to all outward seeming, their privacy assured by Kennison's lens and by his ever-watchful sense of perception. Time after time, completely unconsciously, that sense reached out to other couples, who approached, to touch and to affect their minds so insidiously that they did not know that they were being steered away from the tree in whose black moon shadow sat the lensman and the nurse. Finally the long conversation came to an end, and Kennison assisted his companion to her feet. His frame was straighter, his eyes held a new and brighter light. "'By the way, Kim,' she asked idly as they strolled back toward the ballroom, 
Who is this Clono by whom you were swearing a while ago? Another spaceman's god like Noshba Kimming of the Valerians? Something like him, only more so, he laughed. A combination of Noshba Kimming, some of the gods of the ancient Greeks and Romans, all three of the fates, and quite a few other things as well. I think originally from Corvina, but fairly widespread through certain sections of the galaxy now. He's got so much stuff, teeth and horns, claws and whiskers, tail and everything, that he's much more satisfactory to swear by than any other space god I know of. But why do men have to swear at all, Kim? she queried curiously. It's so silly. For the same reason that women cry, he countered. A man swears to keep from crying. A woman cries to keep from swearing. Both are sound psychology. Safety valves, means of blowing off excess pressure that would otherwise blow fuses or burn out tubes. End of chapter 2